Now I'm really delighted to introduce this evening's speakers. Um, the discussion tonight arrives at a midpoint through a fabulous three-day festival that's being curated by our colleagues at the Black Film Bulletin entitled The Gaze. And if you've not had time to watch the short films and a wonderful essay film that they've curated, um, they will be, the films will be available online until midnight tomorrow night, um, Thursday the 27th. Um, and when I just wanted to say, when we started to plan for the cinema ideas, which was almost a year ago, uh, the Black Film Bulletin were really the first people who we wanted to collaborate with. So I'm really delighted this is happening um, this evening and um, over the past couple of days. Um, so th a big thank you to Dr. June Giovanni, Jan Asante and Melanie Hoyce for your knowledge, passion and really brilliant work. So I'm going to introduce um, the speakers this evening. Um, with a career straddling film education and PR, moving image curator and social media strategist Jennifer G. Robinson's first foray into festival production came by way of the Black Filmmaker International Film Festival, founded by the late filmmaker Menelik Shabazz. Serving as festival coordinator, inspired by the desire to create her own festival, and noting a distinct yet subtle lack of support, collaboration and celebration of Black British women in the film industries, that culminated in the launch of Women of the Lens Film Festival in 2017. Um, and Jennifer, I don't want to let you know, has also given us a brilliant new piece of writing on the short films in the festival and how they resonate and connect with each other and also connect with audiences today. So I urge you to go and read that. Dr. June Giovanni is a London-based film curator, archivist and international consultant in African and African diaspora cinema for more than 35 years. She is director of the June Giovanni Pan-African Cinema Archive. Among many things, she set up and ran the BFI's African and Caribbean Film Unit and created the Black Film Bulletin with Gaylene Gould. She programmed Planet Africa at the Toronto International Film Festival and is known for her knowledge and experience in the field of Pan-African Pan cinema generally. Um, so now I'm delighted to hand over to June and Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. Um, and we're honoured uh, to be to be here and to be collaborating with with you once again. Um, and uh, th thanks everyone who's out there and who's come to to join us in these discussions. We hope that you'll enjoy it. Um, what we're going to be doing is asking each other questions. Um, that helped to unpack more information about the time and the context in which the films were made, and also to try and engage you in a discussion around the films and what they represent. And so, and um, as as Selena has said, it's the two of us, myself and and um, Jennifer, and uh, welcome as well, Jennifer. I don't know if you like to say something first? I'm just really pleased to be here. I'm really pleased to be able to reminisce and look at these three films particularly. Um, so yeah, it's great to be here. Great. <laughs> good, good. Well, I'm glad that you're here too. And um, uh, I think that what from what you've written already, I can see that you you are really uh, very much engaged with the films, and the three films that I think everybody who's on here will have realised or seen on the site are um, Dreaming Rivers, Coffee Coloured Children, and um, and uh, Concrete Garden, Dreaming Rivers by Martina Atiel. Um, uh, Judah, and also um, Coffee Coloured Children by Ngozi Onwara, and Concrete Garden by Ulrich Riley. And the thing is, these, these films have, they work very well as a programme because there are a number of aspects that link them together within the programme, we think. <laughs> and you might think so too when you see them, it would be interesting. But I would like to ask um, um, uh, Jennifer really uh, firstly about a film, uh, a program like this with 
the prior prime uh, that that prioritizes children and their experiences and their perspectives on the world um, are linked in a number of ways, and one of them is through the question and the subject of uh, of the impact of early of early uh, migration on on families and of children, questions of identity and of race. And um, I think that what happens is that um, we then also have to think about the burden of race on the young and on children. And to what extent I was wondering, do we um, believe it still exists today? And how you can think of any films and if you can think of any films that present it in the contemporary context, and what do you believe has changed from the time uh, that these films were made, which were all made in the 1980s? I think, uh, I think it's, I think, uh, Concrete. Uh, Concrete Garden was 1994. Yeah, yeah, that was 94. That was yeah. uh, a graduation film from Central St. Martins. Um, yes, so that was in the early, early 90s, but they were, they, they uh, still had this same agenda of uh, looking at the world from the perspective of these young people. And I was just wondering how you, seeing those, how they resonate with anything that's been happening now or that you've seen now. Um. It's interesting uh, that these films came up when, when they did because Jana Sante, who is currently working with you on the Black Film Bulletin, she made a post on Facebook and it featured images of Black children. And I lamented that it's, very, it's not often that we see children in this way and given voice to speak their own truths. And in fact, it's only recently that we've been seeing uh, ch black children, children of color, uh, um, more prominently in advertising, most recently um, the John Lewis advertising. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then it, it made me understand that we, we don't often get black children expressing themselves about things uh, uh, to do with identity and to do with race. And then these three films came up and I thought, wow, it's fantastic. Here we, are, here we are, here I am, just having made that comment. And now I get the opportunity to have a review of three films, The Concrete Garden, Coffee Colored Children and Dreaming Rivers, really overtly and, and covertly expressing themselves around identity and race. In, in the 1980s, early 1990s, and, and today, and what that means today. I think that, um, I think we, we were discussing this before, I think that um, children were often left to navigate this difficult pathway of race on their own. And we said that, you know, we said there were three reasons. Often it, oftentimes when you went to tell your parents, um, the parents had the idea that you just sucked it up. It was something that you, it was, you had to have a mantle of stoicism and just ride it through. And then it got to the point where you would do that so many times that you just wouldn't mention it anymore. And then even sadder than that is that you kind of got an inkling as a child that actually your parents as adults were going through their own trauma of having to deal with the daily microaggressions of the everyday world. So you, you didn't speak to them anymore and you didn't speak to anyone anymore. You held these kinds of things in. Um, and today, I think I still don't see that expression in, in film. Um, I don't see that very often in terms of young people and definitely children being able to speak about their experiences with racism in that way. 
So these three films are, are just, mm. you know, they just really spoke to me in that way. Mm. Mm. Um, being from uh, the early generation, the first generation that came to the UK from, uh, from uh, the Caribbean, I can definitely identify with so many things in, uh, in these films, especially within uh, Concrete Garden, but also within Dreaming Rivers. Uh, those those two in particular. And although we are looking back at those times, what I've found really interesting in recent years is um, people who came at that time and could have been the young people of that era, uh, who are now coming out with their stories at, in different levels, at different yeah. levels. And I was thinking of some of the young people of that time who might have been farmed out <laughs> to families. And these are young African or Caribbean uh, children who came with their parents um, in the first generation, uh, came with their parents. And at that time, the parents were working, were trying to make a life in the UK. And very often if the children were very, very young, you would have to put them with a family that could look after them like round the clock. Yeah. And that meant that a lot of young African or Caribbean children, definitely Caribbean because it happened in our family as well, um, would be placed with white families. And in fact, um, a film that Adwale Akinuye Agbaji <laughs> made uh, called farming uh, was you know where he speaks about um, you know as a young black uh, boy growing up in a in a in a fostered with a by white parents in a white family and it's just it made me think that these could have been the children at that time and what you were saying about. Um, um, children being left to their own devices to get through this. Mm. I think it was also very, very traumatic for a lot of um, young, young uh, black people that didn't have that support. I mean, a lot of them did have great support from the, the foster families that they were with, but they, but in terms of the, the race issue, that was all, also um, uh, an aspect. And of course, you know, looking back at some of how that time can was 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 quite traumatic and affected um, children uh, quite a lot, but they managed to come through it. Was uh, but that would have been a, that that would have been another reason for uh, why children did not express a lot of their trauma of the time because they saw that their parents were making so many sacrifices. They were working, they were uh, doing everything they could to make ends meet. And then it, it, just, it just didn't seem the right thing to do for you to then come and tell, express your, to your parents what was happening to you as done by other children, but also other adults and adults who were who are charged with caring for you in schools. Mm, yes. so, um, yeah. so, you know, it just wasn't done. So what do you think, what do you think, how do you think those experiences might have helped to form the identity of those children then and what those children might look like now? I wonder, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder because <laughs> I, um, I came in the fifties <laughs> And uh, although by the time I went to, to you know, secondary school, uh, uh, to big school, uh, you know, my mother were, was a lot tougher with me. But right at the beginning, she was the one that had to be tough to even get me, uh, to get the schools to put me into my, uh, you know, in classes with my classmates because I had come from the Caribbean, they definitely stuck me into the, the, the youngest, lowest class possible. And 
were trying to, to pull me back, asked me to write my name, which I did with a joined up flourish. And they insisted that I needed to write it in block letters and looked at me as if I, would, I was a very strange person. And my mother had to go up to the school a few times before they even put me with my classmates. Um, so she was, she was battling then, a nurse having come here, uh, you know, invited to, to come here and then brought me over um, uh, a few years later. So she was battling at, at the time, but later on, uh, by the time you're at secondary school, she expects you to really be, be standing up for yourself. And mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to go on to a lot of those stories, but you were expected to be, to stand up for yourself. And of course, you know, a lot of them, um, you know, they're aware of those, those situations. And of course, it can determine, not necessarily determine, but it can uh, lead you to, um, you know, to find ways in which you can, um, you can have uh, a presence that you can, um, you know, pursue ways that gives you some independence that gives you some strength, that gives you uh, a sense of finding your own feet and finding your, your, your way through uh, a society um, where there are a number of, 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 um, of obstacles, but also finding um, your identity in the sense that you are now in a country that, that um, in which uh, you know, life, your parents have had to struggle and that you're going through something that, that um, uh, you're living in a, in a society that is not as, um, as, uh, as able to deal with or even to accept that you have something to contribute, that you have value, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 that really came out in um, uh, the concrete garden where the little girl still finds pleasure and joy and fun and she brings her little brother with her on her adventures. Um, and also similarly with coffee colored children, um, uh, even after the brutality of those children's experience, they come to a place of self-acceptance and mm. self-preservation and mm. discard all of the stuff that was put on them as children to say, this is who I am, this mm. is who I'm going to be. And basically I don't care what, what you or society thinks about that. And mm. this is how I'm gonna move and navigate my way. And, and that was really quite clear in those films. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the films then, at the time, what do you think were some of the difficulties that the filmmakers would have faced or what were the challenges in the context of the times that those films were made? Do you think? Well, I think um, there, there were a number of, dif of difficulties um, for, um, I mean, two of the filmmakers did go to the National Film School um, right. and Godley went as did um as did Ulrich. Ulrich is as many people will know he's the director of on Bridgerton and he did the Stephen Lawrence drama Conviction and many other um television uh, dramas so he's he's somebody that's that's working continually and has and he comes from a, a, a background his background was in acting that's what brought him to um to that and uh Ngozi, um, both of them have um, made, made other, in fact, um, Ngozi's uh, first two short films, which is Concrete Garden, but also um, The Body Beautiful. And she says about, um, con um, sorry, Coffee Colored, Coffee Colored Children. Children. She says about Coffee Colored Children that it was the film that she had to make to make before any other film in yeah. her career. It's, it was cathartic. It was to get through something that had actually been, um, a, you know, something that had, had uh, 
factored in significantly in their lives and that they had to get over. And it was her and, and uh, her brother, Simon Onwara, who's also, he was the producer of, of most of, of her films. And of mm -hmm. course, he's, he's a, a character that, that's represented in, in the film. But I think um, uh, both, both Ulrich and, um, and uh, Ngozi, Ulrich in particular speaks about um, the experience of um, uh, what, what he found difficult or that words was most challenging, I think is the word of the words he used was, you know, it's great to be in, in, uh, in the film school, but um, there you, you are faced at the same time as the impact of technology, you're also faced with cultural barriers that you have to address and that can also be, 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 be also be very, very challenging. And, and is, that, is that even before you get to the actual filmmaking and telling your stories, you, you have to get over that before you even do that? Well, this is it, but also, I mean, we'll talk about it in, the, in terms of uh, the decolonizing um, aspect, which I think is something that, you know, plays into this. But I think also it was um, the, the idea that, that um, sorry, I forgot what I was, was going to say. It was the idea that you can, um, um, you know, what you're going to do and what you're hoping to do is coming from a different place. And for instance, in the Blackburn Bulletin interview that, that um, Gaylene did with, with um, Ulrich back in 1993, he cites his inspiration as Charles Burnett in terms of styles. And so, and that's as a major influence on him. And he reminds us that the influence um, to his cinematic eye and style, not only Charles, it can come from various places. And so he also cites the inspiration from the Dutch uh, artist Vermeer on the matter of natural light. And so um, the thing is you negotiate all of these things in terms of a cultural reference and understanding, but it depending on what it is you want to do. And he wanted to pursue a career as a filmmaker and as an artist and as a filmmaker. Um, that means he would be looking in a wider sense for the best possible influences mm -hmm. in what he wants to do. So I think people do um, find their ways. They have to negotiate these things, but they find their way through it. And uh, he was one of the people, Ulrich was one of the people that used to come up to the, um, to the African Caribbean unit a lot. <laughs> he used to come there a lot. And of course, as, as uh, people may or may not know, People like, like Steve McQueen would come there too. So there was, you know, this, there was, you were aware that there were these community of filmmakers that were looking for that connection and people who would understand what it is they are going through or how they have to, or to look for stories or help or suggestions about how you negotiate um, uh, within the cultural sphere of these organizations, how you negotiate what it is you want to do and what it is you want to achieve. And they were looking for communities of people to talk to. And all of them do did talk about um, the, the, the support network that that can, can give them to, to help them get through uh, sometimes some quite, quite difficult times. So why do you think that that support network hasn't uh, flourished so much to, to for, so that we have something like that today? I mean, uh, I think um, that support network in the 80s was one of the reasons why the Black Film Workshops came into being. Um, um, and the workshops, I should say, came into being in the 80s. And it started in, in the north of England with uh, workshops 
like Amber and Trade and the Black Workshops came in uh, slightly later. And these were young black filmmakers leaving training, leaving film school, et cetera. And there was this structure that allowed you to work collectively. And the fact that collective working and the workshops was so prolific and that they were able to produce so much was partly to do with the structures that were set up, uh, the workshop structures that were set up um, to support that work through the unions, Channel 4, um, BFI, etc. Et and um, that collective working was something that, that really helped a lot of people to, to achieve quite a bit. But then a number of them weren't in, within workshops and were still needing to find and have that, that support network for, for, what the, for what they wanted to do. And I think that um, those were some of the, the, the ways that people were able to survive in the industry. Mm. So um, in terms of your incredible um, archive, the Pan-African Cinema Archive, what aspects of these films lend themselves to your archive? So is it in their actual filmmaking? Is it in the filmmakers? Is it about the context of the films? In what ways do they sit within your archive? Clearly they do, but how? Yes. I mean, it's called the Dune Giovanni Pan-African Cinema Archive because yeah. it is the word. <laughs> it, it, yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little, a little uh, plug. <laughs> But uh, forget about the June Giovanni bit. It's the Pan African <laughs> Cinema Archive, which um, you know people should understand. It's it's to do with pe uh, black people, people of color, um, and of course I'm talking a lot about the '80s. And of course in the '80s, black the term black film, which was also yeah. the term that was used a lot, yeah. combined both African Caribbean and Asian. So the Black Film Workshops, for instance, there are Asian workshops. And also we all worked quite closely together. So in terms of what we were doing, um, uh, very often concepts of third cinema were at the, the, the base of that. And so you would find Indian filmmakers and curators and people. We worked very closely together and across, across the board. But um, in terms of what is in the archive. The archive came about from curating, doing the, the curation of that sort of material. And it was shaped in a way by what was happening at the time. It was very much shaped by what was happening at the time. We were working with concepts and ideas around third cinema, and that's what brought me into this sector. But also at that time, the young filmmakers who were um, setting themselves up into collectives and working independently, were also looking for um, a range of, of, um, uh, of connections and understanding. Um, uh, they were also developing ideas that challenged the conventions of cinema. And so um, when we were taking these films uh, beyond the UK, to the Caribbean, linking it to Africa. And my curation was very much um, on those terrains. It was, uh, they were, people were interested in what was happening in black films in the UK. They were interested in, in the, the, uh, on the Caribbean continent, in particular, the Francophone continent, but also uh, the African continent. And so uh, the work of, um, you know, Martina, a film like, like Dreaming Rivers, the work of Isaac, and so very close to their St. Lucian culture, also very significant when those films go to a festival like Imash Karib in Martinique, where I was programming. And, you know, because all of those countries speak the Creole that you hear in Dreaming Rivers, they all speak that Creole, Creole language. 
and it's a cultural identity that the filmmakers here were also embracing. So they're not only Black British, but they were, and you know, Ngozi with her African context uh, of, of where, you know, where she, she what her, is in her heritage had also been making films, has, has made films that, that reflect and, and uh, embrace that as well. That, that part of her heritage. And um, I, I mean, going back to Ulrich's work, um, uh, Concrete Garden, when you look at that, when I looked at that film, I also thought of another film that, you know, that I know of, and that is, we have it. The thing is sometimes within the archive, we don't have the actual film, but we have different elements of the films. and what is in the archive is to do with the context in which they were made, what was said about them, um, where they were shown, how they were received, um, and, uh, and how they were programmed, what were they programmed with. And I was thinking of the work of Rhys Auguste, who was a member of uh, the Black Audio Film Collective, and his film, um, um, uh, God, it's just gone out of my head. His film, um, the oh, Twilight City, which we have, we don't have the film in the archive, of course, but we do have a most beautiful poster and we have information about when it was shown and where and that sort of thing. But it's it really resonates with me in terms of, of what Ulrich's film has done because it features a young girl whose mother has used to live in, in the UK and had gone back to live in the Caribbean. And it's this young girl writing to her mother about, yeah. about the city of London, how it's changed. And, and through that film, he explores different communities within the UK. So I think, um, I think the films um, actually uh, do very much connect uh, with the UK, but also, uh, sorry, with the, the, the their cultural origins as well on other continents. And one of the other things that was very strong element was um, the link with the USA and the um, uh, American, Black American filmmakers, writers and people were very impressed with what was coming out of the UK. And so they would write about them. And so were we, we were quite impressed. In <laughs> fact, the Black Film Bulletin was um, inspired when the, the Black Film Review, which was an African-American uh, Black film magazine, inspired us to do the Black Film Bulletin. And Black Film Review would often review the films coming out of the UK. So um, there was, the, the archive has a lot of that, a lot of that history um, and a lot of um, how, it could uh, play into today, what its, what its relevance is for today. Yeah, I mean, we, we do have some questions here, but before we get to the questions, there's Hello. one, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong. One of the reasons that I, I love, particularly like um, The Concrete Garden is because this is a story told through a little girl's eyes. And at that time, I think the only other person who had done this in terms of film would have been Menelik Shabazz's Burning an Illusion. Um, is that is that? Am I right in thinking that? You know, telling that story and the the girl or the the female being the the female protagonist. Character. Yeah, well, I'm not. Well, I mean, it's something to think about. But I in of, of 80, that time, 82, 80, 81, 82. He made it the beginning of the eighties, and I'm trying to think of who might have done so in other the than other than these two in the UK. Yeah, in the UK, absolutely. Mm. Let's think but, about that. But I well, I mean, I think Dreaming Rivers as well. Of course, the, the children are are older. Yeah. And, and so, but I mean, the young woman in uh, in Burning an Illusion is also their, their sort of age, she, she is um, a, a second generation 
person. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, but in terms of children as young as this, I'll have to think about it. They have been, uh, they would have been, and I'm sure that there are some, well, there's, there's the work that Lionel and Gakane did with the little boy and the little girl. It's called Jemima and Johnny. Oh, yes, and of course. It, and yeah. of course, it explores, they are, they are exploring uh, Notting Hill during or just after the race riots. And right. their, world, their world is completely, and it, it actually, now mentioning it, that, I always think about that little girl when I think about Concrete Garden because it's a similar sort of situation because in, uh, you know, in Jemima and Johnny, the family have just arrived from the Caribbean or wherever. The adults all go in and greet each other. And she with her little ribbons and her thing goes out to play and this little white boy and they just go off and explore the world. And you see the world around them is so racially charged and, and you know, very similar. Quite, quite, but but their world is very different. So I think I I would need to think about it a bit more. I'm yeah. sure that there are there yeah. are um, uh, in terms of uh, Black British uh, um, experience there, there would be. So uh, let's have a look at one of these questions. So a question I have here is: What was the impact of these films at the time? Are there any filmmakers working today who you think are doing similar work as shown in these in these three films? So what was the impact of the films at the time, do you think? I think at the time they were, you know, people were very glad to see them. Yeah. I mean, and they were shown definitely, I mean, some of them were shown, I mean, these films were made some of them were made with support from Channel 4 television, which of course was also an 80s phenomenon. So it was at a time when there was going, there were other platforms for things. Um, uh, there were other platforms for, for what they were wanting to do. But um, yeah, I think that, that um, there, you know, there were, they tended to be not only put into cultural spheres, they worked very closely across the artistic sphere. In fact, there was a lot of artistic collaboration on all of these films. If you look at who was the, the, the um, 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 gosh, <laughs> I can't remember her, her role, set designer on Dreaming Rivers, is Sonia Boyce, you know, right. for instance. And you have the names of big artists working with these filmmakers who were also artists. They yeah. came to the, and people see them mainly as having a cultural agenda, but they were people who had serious ambitions as artists, yeah. and as, as people who wanted to be seen in that context as filmmakers, mm. so they wanted to be seen as filmmakers and for their work to be seen in that way. Yeah. And I think at that time, there were also a number of people who were setting up screening programs and possibilities. Yeah. Mark Booth was doing, you know, Nubian Tales. There were other, there were alternative um, places for showing cinema, not just in small cultural contexts, and community centers and so, but there were other places where cinema and film was taken seriously as well as, as the cultural dimension. And that echoes back to the 60s because in the 60s when a lot of um, uh, artists were, were working here from, from the Caribbean or from Africa, et cetera, they were working across, across the art forms and they were supporting each other across the art forms. So it's true that people like some of the earlier ones like Horace, Ove and so have that background and that history. Um, but, the, but the link across the art forms was definitely a 
feature and a factor in the time that these these films were being made? I mean, certainly for me, in the second part of this question, um, I, I come across uh, women filmmakers uh, doing this kind of work all the time. When I get the submissions, there are uh, uh, women who are exploring ideas about identity, exploring ideas about womanhood, exploring ideas that are outside of the boundaries of what they've been raised to believe that they should be. And a lot of it is experimental as well. So I, I see them quite often. Uh, sadly, many of them aren't going to get the profile that we see um, uh, many mainstream directors getting, but they're on their way and their careers are being nurtured and they are moving in that, in that direction. Um, is there, are there one or two, before we move on to the next question, is there anyone that you can think of that's specifically working doing this particular type of work? Because there are a few doing lots of popular types of things which are equally important, but you know, mm -hmm. in terms of identity, what, what, who would you say in the UK? Um, I need to think about that. <laughs> you should, that's a question you should have asked me before, so I could have... Uh, <laughs> could have thought a bit more about it. That's one, that's one from our on. audience. I will, I will bear it in mind and-, and Okay, think. okay. Mm -hmm. So our next question is for you, June, and it's, uh, can you tell us a bit more about the work of the African Caribbean unit at the BFI? Oh, what do, what do you want to know? Um, the African Caribbean unit, um, I had been working at BFI from, um, 1990, 89, 90, and um, uh, within uh, exhibition and, and uh, distribution, and um, would also had also been continuing my in my own time and external to this because I was on contract to the BFI. I was never fully a full uh, full person there, but um, uh, fully. Uh, employed person with you know with all the rest of what it entails. I was on contract there for for quite uh, for a number of years, but in the early eight in the in the um, early nineties, um, there was also a discussion around what was happening. It came through Third Cinema. My predecessor there was Jim Pines. And outside of the BFI, I had already been working with um, on small projects. Uh, one that uh, Jim supported that I did was the to put together a listing of uh, black films av available for distribution. Because when I first went to the BFI, I was working with uh, curation uh, and working with the regional film theatres and putting black film into, into that agenda. And so um, that came out of this, of this uh, project that I did before I went to the BFI, which was this research and putting together just a listing of black films in distribution or available in the UK. And that was in 88 and I did another one in 89 or 90. And then started, um, at the BFI um, in that department, but with others who we were doing, who, who I'd been working with over time, people like Pervez Khan, who was based in, in, um, in, in uh, Birmingham and others, there was a real sense of a need for something to happen because people were bombarding me and bombarding the BFI with um, questions and demands and so around this area. And it was something that um, uh, we tried to negotiate through the Department of uh, Education at the BFI, as well as people like uh, Sheila Whitaker, who was running the, the London Film Festival and uh, the curation um, programming at that, at that part, that 
at that side, but also to do with production. And uh, there was internal discussion going on that I was part of, but I think it was something that Jim, Jim Pines, who had been there since the late seventies was helping to negotiate. And so um, it was decided that we could have this Pan Institute uh, unit that would be able to respond to all of this internally across the BFI, but also externally, um, uh, because there was a lot of interest in what was happening in the UK. Yeah. And they wanted to be seen to be, to be um, uh, actually doing this because by then four, four workshops were, four black workshops were in existence. Um, you know, Chedo Sankofa, Black Audio Film Collective and Retake and plus a number of other smaller structures on the outside, like Star Productions. And I noticed when looking at uh, Dreaming Rivers again, that um, uh, that was shot at Star Productions, who were not a recognized um, um, uh, workshop, but they were, were working in the industry at the time. But the idea is that, was that there would be this Pan Institute unit that would work across across the BFI, very small, um, argued strongly for there to be an African Caribbean unit and an Asian unit, that didn't work. But Pervez and I, and as I said to you, we were working together anyway as, as black people. So um, uh, that, that unit came into being when we were able to make a strong argument for there to be not just me, but there needed to be uh, someone uh, else. We argued for that and we got um, Gaylene, the wonderful, <laughs> inspiring uh, Gaylene Gould, who came in like whoosh. <laughs> she came in from Leicester, from her, she, you know, her university days with ideas and energy and everything. And we were able to do so much more, not being, you know, just one person. And we were able to, to actually do quite a lot of things. And it was at that time also that we set up the Black Film Bulletin. And mm -hmm. within the three years, and that was because we were getting so many demands, both locally on, on around this area of work, but also internationally, people would be contacting us and coming over from the US and, you know, exchange, the exchange between us at the time was very, very significant. And so mm -hmm. the unit, and the unit did Pan Institute projects. One of the big ones was Africa 95, which we did, there was a, um, Africa 95 was a big national uh, festival, arts festival, and uh, we handled the film dimension of that, which included 12 different projects, including a major conference, different things. Mm -hmm. The unit itself was somewhere where filmmakers would come to and people interested in the filmmakers would come to, and they would do that both from here, but also from internationally. Um, and then it, it uh, I don't know, well, obviously, the, the powers that be within the BFI decided that they needed to move things around in a slightly different way. And there was discussion about whether it was going to be useful to continue that and whether they needed to put resources into another area. And paradoxically, that was the archive. I think that was when... Um, um, uh, God, his name's gone out of my head as well. Um, yes, who, who now runs the London Indian Film Festival when he joined uh, the BFI and that was in the archive. He joined the archive in that. Um, in the last few minutes, uh, you and I, we had a, a, a discussion about decolonizing this gaze. That was my question for you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, decolonizing the gays, um, decolonizing the cinema, uh, the, the filmmaking. Yeah, because I think that 
I think that um, this decolonization, um, I don't, it's a word that we hear all the time and it's banded about a lot. And I think the, certainly for me, it's quite important to, to bring it to practical, tangible terms. What does that mean for filmmakers today um, trying to, to hone their craft and then think about this decolonizing process? What does that mean, say, for example, when trying to get a set design or trying to look at distribution or trying to look at their marketing? Mm. Is it, do you think it's just about, certainly I don't think it's just about what we see in front of the screen. Mm. What, what do you think, what, how do you think that we go uh, about definitely making- not. Definitely not. I mean, um, I think <laughs> uh, for things like this, you need to do need to go back to what, where it came from. And of course it was a conception that Fanon, it's a Fanonian conception, Franz Fanon spoke yeah. about decolonization because that was put, put the responsibility on you yourself to identify, um, um, uh, to decolonize your mind in terms of um, being aware that there are influences that might want you to be and to look at the world in a particular way. But what you have to do is to work out for yourself what is in your interests and what might, might work better, not only in your interests, but in the interests of the world that you care about. Um, uh, and so decolonization, I think, um, is something that you can harness and take through to come out with the best possible solution in whatever it is you're trying to do and in whatever it is your you value within the society and the culture in which you live and that's why it is so widely uh, um, resonant within everything that's been happening I would say in, you know, in so many different aspects of life, whether it's to do with, and it, it crosses over definitely within, within the arts. It's something that is used a lot within the arts, especially any activity that is to do with representation. So hence the arts, hence film, but also with in the idea of Pan-Africanism to do with, with uh, locations. Where, where are we talking about? And who is in control of what's happening in those areas? I think, yeah, I think, I think those, those are some of the things, but in terms of as filmmakers, and uh, it is to also to do with, with how you use your art, how you use your skill to better represent or to put out there or to challenge conventions that do not serve what it is you want to do or what it is you value or puts down what you value. And that's why I mentioned um, Ulrich's uh, choice of um, Charles Burnett's inspiration for him, because it depends on where you where you choose to, to take that and how you use it. I know um, when you wrote your article, you mentioned about the, the amount of time the filmmakers take, took, and especially I think you were thinking of Dreaming Rivers, but also Concrete Garden in that way, all of them, in fact, the way that they, they take time to, uh, to, to present the internal feeling uh, that's externalized within those, the, the actions and situations within the films. Um, uh, and those, those sort of uh, choices are some things that, that, that you can bring in which you can harness to present a different understanding in a different world or communicate to the audiences in a different way what is happening rather than just put it in the dialogue. And so, um, and it enriches, it's a very enriching um, uh, experience. 
that you leave for your audience, especially in Dreaming Rivers. It's yeah. very, very re rewarding um, visually, but also in terms of the feel that you take from it. Just as I thought, we haven't got enough time to, to talk more about what we want the, what you, in more depth. And I hope we're going to be able to, you know, extend this uh, at another time. But thank mm -hmm. you so much. It, the conversation was an absolute pleasure. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, June. Thank you, Jennifer, so much. Um, I'm so sorry that we've run out of time. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, I just love the way that you were just bouncing off ideas and histories and people's names and times that I, I don't you know that I've only heard about and I don't really know that much about so um, I'm really so grateful that you know that you, you spared the time this evening to kind of share your thoughts um, and sort of connect connect kind of histories up you know and 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 different art forms and different kind of moments which I think is just so important um, as sustenance for how we might sort of create art and um, resist today mm. um, I'm sorry that we run out of time, so I think I have to close the discussion. And thank you yeah. so much, everyone who joined the discussion. Um, I should say that the films are still streaming on the ICO um, Center of Ideas website until tomorrow evening at midnight. Um, those are the three films that we've been talking about, as well as this beautiful essay film that the Black Film Bulletin made about their archive and history. Um, that's um, on the website too and also June has given a really great introduction to the Black Film Bulletin and what they're doing now working with Sight and Sound. Um, I'm sorry we didn't talk more about your festival Jennifer, I would really love to have asked you a question about you know what you are doing with your film uh, festival and programming now but maybe oh. another time. Yeah. Um, so thank you both, I don't know if there's any lasting words you wanted to say. I just wanted to say I've just seen a question on there but I wanted to say maybe what what it might be good to do if if um, ICO has a a log or a blog in in uh, in relation to this platform uh, maybe there's some other way of you know putting at least an answer to a couple of things that are still still uh, questions that are still floating out. We out could there. absolutely do that. Maybe we could Send get to write something Send more for us for our blog. That's a that's a wonderful idea to continue the conversation. Um, not not uh, in a big way. <laughs> we don't have a lot of time, but at least uh, to answer a couple of the questions that, that yeah. are are in the you know that people have put out there. So. Absolutely, that sounds a great idea. Um, so I think that's it. I, and the next, just to remind people, the next Cinema of Ideas event is on the 8th of February with Ashley Clark. Oh, God. Um, which will be, I think, super, super interesting, talking about his film pro programming and writing um, career to date. He's from London, but he's based in the States now, and he's had this formidable career, and he's still super young. So I think that's going to be really exciting. Um, and yes, once again, thank you, June, and thank you, Jennifer, so much for... Spent, um, for sharing your thoughts with us this evening and goodbye thank everyone thank you for coming thank you ICO thank you Jennifer for your patience <laughs> bye <laughs> my pleasure thank you bye bye bye, bye.